Okay, so that's the cover of the book, and it's uh, interesting in itself because it's a fast track, of course. It's on, I'll show an image of uh, 860 Lakeshore Drive later, and that, of course, was just pure skeleton. And then the next layer went on, and the next layer went on the concrete. And, but this, this is just all... Um, uh, actually, Yale originally wanted me to put the great Stoller photograph, the iconic. I had some, it's on the back, <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is just you know if you're going to say about Billy C, we may, may as well see it being built. Uh, well, this is a corporate thing. This is my father, and uh, he. Uh, well, we'll get to that. This is this was the team to a certain extent. Uh, Philip Johnson on the left. Uh, Meath, I of course went and uh, I did about six weeks of research to decide who, who, just meeting all the architects that were talked of, I'll, t I'll say that a little bit more. And uh, that's of course a photograph of the model behind, and of course the spine, that one, one by three base spine. <laughs> this is one of the photographs that Carol talked about. There's another woman, she was a secretary, I believe, right here. Oops. But uh, this, this is an interesting thing because this is a building management association, BMO. It's a big uh, organization that, that exists now and uh, still. And because of the, I think it was the Chrysler building, which had about a zero square, uh, square foot uh, uh, space on the top, and they wanted to make sure that built skyscrapers would be actually economical. So they came, they, they sort of grouped up to try and, and, and interview buildings by people. Well, the reason that Seagram Building was reviewed was because um, this is um, <laughs> Eli J. Kahn. And actually, the person who put the team together mostly, I mean, I said me, so then uh, um, the head of the Fuller Company said he was, he was given the job because of, of, tr of trust. And of course, it was the major um, uh, construction company, not only in New York, but across the, the country. And Mies used to say, you saw a Fuller sign everywhere in New York the way you saw Walgreens signs, signs in Chicago. But uh, so that, and he, uh, they were just there to do the working drawings. But he uh, got together with this guy, who was the clerk of the works, a very disappointed old architect, and, and this creep, <laughs> who was the head of the building committee. And uh, I got off to, this was 55, Mies had started with the building model, had already been built, uh, ex ex existed by 55. And then I went off to Greece for a couple of weeks. And um, when I came back, there was this great meeting because uh, um, Con and Jacobs had said, you know, this means he does these simple buildings. You know, in New York it's complicated. You have to very complicate things. So he decided that he was just a child. He didn't know anything about buildings. And they said, of course, it was ridiculous to make a three by five bay building with a one by three bay building behind. And so they made a th four by five bay building. And so I went down and said, look here, you know, that is not what you were uh, asked to do. You were asked to do the working drawings and not to do any design. <laughs> and they said, we didn't change anything. They couldn't see that the a four by five building really is not where it was at. So anyway, I, we were all a little bit nervous and things like that. But they, uh, they came out, of course, this group saying it was the most the wonderful building and, and that was that. But these are the kind of, you know, so one had to sort of run clear of these kind of things. I don't want to go too much into the, the you know, difficulty of doing that, you all recognize that this, this things true love never goes smoothly. And so the place, well, the place was Park Avenue, and I suppose you all know that the reason it's called Park Avenue because of this park. And this park is there because it was an open cut in this city, and it went down, oh, all the way down to, of course, 42nd Street, uh, to Grand Central, uh, which wasn't built. Well, I guess it was getting built then, but um, it uh, it um, covered the tr tracks. And so all the buildings, as you know, were all uh, one 11 stories high. It, it was zoned, and this is the interesting thing. The area from 50th to 53rd, no, 57th, sorry, was zoned residential, as was uh, everything above there. And um, in 19... 29. 
the um, the owners of most of the land there was the Grand Central uh, Company and also the Guillet family. And they said, oh, you know, if we go above 50th to 57th, let's make that commercial. It'll be much better. They did that, but this is, of course, the time of the, uh, of the uh, Great Depression and then the war. And so this whole area became very interesting afterwards because... Um, this is the uh, building that, uh, three, this is 375 Park, as it used to be, it was 1913. And, and uh, so that was the building that was required to, to put the, um, uh, the building there. And it was a long history of acquisition I won't go into, but this is kind of the situation of New York then. This is 1953 or 54. And so they're trying to make a big deal about skyscrapers in New York. And of course, the people who were, uh, who were uh, um, advising Seagram were basically all these companies that were real estate companies. And of course, the one uh, company, the um, uh, Fuller Company. But, and so they, they had this sort of wonderful thing. And then these are the images of the buildings. They thought this was okay. And Seagram's, of course, got letters from them saying these are all the buildings uh, that are being built now. And Seagram no longer had, well, I guess here, okay, I'll, I'll go back to that uh, in a minute. Um, and so, anyway, this is an extraordinary drawing. This is 57. This is Fuller Company made this. And so this shows one company is doing all these buildings uh, from, you know, from 62nd Street down to uh, 42nd Street. And, of course, this was also happening on 6th, 6th Avenue. Seagram was offered space on 6th Avenue. And you see, of course, the Seagram building there. But these were all the buildings that were constru under construction and not. So you have something really very interesting in this area. Nobody has really twigged to it. And that is the fact that you have this kind of uh, building type that and this is and it's, and I hate to see too many of those go they're, they're all getting sort of kneaded up now because they really it, the whole area was really pretty well made up all those new buildings you saw were pretty much this kind of thing these wedding cakes that were set back laws because of the zoning laws and um Actually, Seagram took space. Sorry, uh, Seagram took space in this big building. It's 390 Madison, and of course, it wasn't built yet. But uh, but my father went into one of the, you know, the officers of the company were doing all this stuff, and he wasn't paying too much attention to it. I must say, he'd been in the they'd been in the um, Chrysler building since uh, four years after the Chrysler building was built. And, you know, a spacious, wonderful, great, dramatic entry, etc. And they had these marvelous kind of neo-Gothic, um, uh, oh, I, that's really funny, uh, offices. I didn't bring a photograph of it, but it was done by, what's the name of the guy who did the... Uh, 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 huh? Morris Lapidus? Yeah, Morris Lapidus. <laughs> <laughs> which is a, so I keep on saying that Mies succeeded Morris Lapidus. <laughs> oh <my God>. Nice <laughs> job. <laughs> so, well, he, Morris, I mean, he just did those. Three. Anyway, the problem was that they uh, needed the space and they, they couldn't, uh, the, 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 the um, Chrysler building couldn't accommodate it. So they took, they uh, had con con contracted actually for six stories in this. And then, then my father went to see it and he said, oh my God, we can't do that. So th they decided to build their own building. And uh, so they were looking for various places uh, to build. They looked at the, uh, the club on 60th, the, what is it, the great club on the corner of 60th and 5th Avenue. and Metropolitan, hmm? Metropolitan Club. Yeah, yeah, and you know, all these wonderful places, can you imagine? And I think they even considered this building, but uh, of course this is immediately across the street, so that's Park Avenue on the uh, west, on the north side, no, east-west, well, thank you, on the west side, and that's 53rd up there and 52nd down here. And the, the labor house had already been built by 51, 52, so it was quite an, an, an interesting area. And, uh, but Seagram didn't quite know how to, how to approach anything. And so the head of the Fuller Company got together with the um, 
the, the realtor that was going to you know, rent the buildings and with Con and Jacobs, because they loved Con and Jacobs, they thought that they did the best buildings in New York, you know, building on the corner of um, 57th and, um, and uh, uh, let's see, the uh, south, south, East corner of uh, 57th and, um, and, and Park, which looks, you know, a stripy building. It was actually for a universal. But uh, that's another tale about that. But anyway, so they made drawings of what the, 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 what the site could contain. If you built it, I don't know if this is 100% out or something like that. And they made a few of his, uh, and then this one is like the lever house, obviously. And this would be just, the other building would be you could rent in it, uh, space in it and you have your own 200,000 square feet. And this was, of course, the lever house, which would be a one family thing. And they also did this building, which is kind of interesting to see this, this setback on the plaza. And people at that time were simply not interested in, uh, you know, the highest and best use. It just didn't exist. You didn't have to fill the envelope. It just was not in the vocabulary at that point. What was in the vocabulary was that you could seed the clouds uh, and make rain when you wanted to. You could use clear diagrams to make the, uh, 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 to, to make a concert halls so you could understand what the acoustics would be. And of course it was a time of huge changes when the American uh, art, art New York came to the center of the art world, big change, and um, uh, also the developers started to really become important. Of course, now by 1990s, there was talk about the developers being the the, the real um, uh, uh, aristocrats of New York, and uh, you know they were riding very high, and they were just sort of uh, beginning. So it was a, a period of huge change. Well, Seagram was going to have, I just can't leave that on too long. Seagram was going to uh, have a um, uh, 75th anniversary, I guess. And so that man, who was the big salesman for, for um, Seagram's, he was the chief salesman, Seven Crown and all that stuff. And he, and he um, was the one who sort of was pushing this because he wanted for all his salesmen to have a great big uh, bash out and say, this is the building you're going to have and we'll put your name on the, on the bricks that uh, tile the floor and we'll do this and do that and everything else. And so he, 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 he did that and um, sort of contracted with Charlie Luckman who the big salesman of Seagram knew because he was across the street. He was the CEO of Leverhouse. And Charlie Luckman had trained as an architect originally. And I had met him on the boat going to Europe a couple of years earlier. And I, I knew that he was a no good guy. And when I saw this building, it was, I mean, it's just so appalling. And so I wrote this letter. This is just the first page of a letter that is six pages typed type to this way, uh, explaining to my father that, uh, first of all, I said, no, 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 you can't do this. And if, if, if you're going to build a building, you have a responsibility. You know, you, you could just uh, take a, a space somewhere else, but you have a real responsibility to do something that's the best you can do for your society. And uh, then I spoke to him about the Renaissance and the, um, the, why the Renaissance was good because of a change of attitude of the microcosm and macrocosm and such things. And I said, you know, we are in a different time now. And they're the greatest architects now living that have lived since the Renaissance. And I started to think about the building buildings with glass, and I said, well, why not? And I think I used those words without ever knowing Mies about the light reflections. I never, never knew about that. But anyway, it was a, it's really a terrific letter. I must say, I, myself, I'm impressed by it. Uh, but, and so the result was that he said to me, well, come back and choose the marble. <laughs> so I said, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. So my father, my mother said, well, dearie, why don't we ask her to come back? Maybe she can do something. The, the, the upshot was that I went to see Alfred Barr and Philip Johnson and uh, we, and then I uh, my father insisted that I see this, uh, um, the head of the Fuller Company Mr. Crandall and I was terrified about that but I just knew so much I thought I just uh, you know I was a quick study and of course I knew something before this I worked uh, on, on uh, when I was at college and stuff and so I um, uh, I, I was asked to be the head of the uh, to choose the architect and I did that 
by, as I said, six weeks of visiting people in their offices. And who did I visit? Well, of course, I did some of the big firms that Crowder wanted me to do. But basically, Errol Saradin was a great list maker. And so he and Philip uh, Johnson, I was at Philip Johnson's one weekend, and he and Aline were, uh, Errol and Aline were there. And so Errol said, you know, we should do those who could and shouldn't, those who should and couldn't, and those who could and should. <laughs> and so the big firms are the shouldn'ts, but they could, I mean, because you could build on the, And the other ones, the second group was because they were good architects, interesting architects at least, and that they, but they hadn't had the experience of building a tall building in New York. And, you know, it's a little hard to do something like that without having, although I must say, Diller and Scafidi have done pretty well there. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he, um, and so I came back with Mies, and so that, well, that was started. Of course, you know about Mies' great 1921 grass skyscraper, which he couldn't possibly build, and he got to Chicago in, this is 1952, these buildings were completed, but this, of course, when Mies said, you know, it, it's the, let's see, I just want to give you that text because it's so nice. Um, only skyscrapers under construction reveal their bold construct, constructive thoughts. And then the impression made by their soaring skeletal frames is overwhelming. On the other hand, on the other hand then he said, you know, masonry doesn't make any sense. We must not try to solve new problems with traditional forms. It is far better to derive new forms from the essence, the very nature of the new problems. And so, uh, you know, this is a, a gorgeous frame of 860. And here we come uh, to the Seagram building. Well, I, to me, the major thing about the Seagram building is the plaza. You know, they, everybody talked about the um, uh, importance of the bronze, and that's what everybody always talks about. And they talk about the Seagram building. Well, it's not a building. It's a building and it's a plaza. And it's a whole thing. So there's so many things that about it that are important. The, the fact that you... Um, uh, that you have this pl uh, pl plaza, and of course it goes right the way through. And then, uh, of course, these are the pieces that were added because without having bought this land, you know, we didn't have it initially, you had to be able to have enough land to be able to make it 25% tower, which gave you a big enough floor to be able to make a viable building. And so, uh, and, and then also the, you know, there's a big, big slope down here. There's a quite a big slope uh, in this way also. And, but Mies would walk around there. And he, 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 he set the building back because he, f he felt you could never see a building. You know, they're all tied up against the, si the sidewalk and there was just no way of being able to see the, bu the building. And um, uh, as you know, it changed the laws in New York. By 1961, I think it was, the, um, um, the, 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 the laws were, they studied both the Seagram building and, and the Lever House, and that was 25% of the t tower. And this, of course, 25% also, except for the fact what was important about Seagram was really this plaza, and plazas were made all over New York. And uh, you got 10 square feet, for, yeah, for one square foot of open plaza, you got 10 square feet of added volume to your building. Well, everybody bought that. That was just a big w windfall. And uh, so it continued that, that, that way. And then, except that one of the problems was, oh, well, something interesting here I want to show you, is you see these fountains. They didn't work very well. It was just Philip did the fountains. And they were very puny. But then he redid them and made them upstairs, up front. So it was just an early view. <laughs> That makes you laugh. <laughs> well, no, they were, they, were, they were too winchy, you know, they needed more mass. And so the public space and zoning, so this is really what I want to talk about. I, I'm going to talk about zoning. I, I'm going to talk really about the, um, there's a word I can't find, but, but, but how, you, uh, how you really make sure that a building is going to be good from the beginning, uh, and, and also how you 
have to protect it once it's up. You know, in America, we think, you know, you, the whole experience of America was you came somewhere and you cut and, once it, uh, and, and built, and then once it got crowded, you moved on. Well, you can't do that anymore. And um, so that the idea that maintenance was what went with that. And so people did, had no sense of maintenance, and we know that with our streets and everything else now. Well, here again is the plan of the building. And uh, I mean, it has so many marvelous parts of it. You know, you go across from uh, uh, the, the, uh, the um, Mitke and Kim and White building uh, way across the park. You have this very wide side, sidewalk here. You uh, go across. This, of course, should be uh, uh, indicated the same way because it's, it's also paved. Everything is paved. So are the pa pools paved. And it's all paved right through, right through here. And this is, of course, where the Picasso curtain uh, is. And that's a problem right now, but we'll go with that eventually. No, I won't, but uh, it's a problem. And uh, so it means that, you know, usually in an office building, you come bang up against a wall here. And uh, so and you, you, people get sucked up and, um, and sort of like a sap in a tree or something. But here you can come in, walk through, go down 52nd to 53rd, go into the Four Seasons, go out that way, and uh, up from Four Seasons. But also, uh, well, of course, you have these wonderful trees on, on the side. And then also, um, what was the other thing I wanted to remark? Well, I'm not sure. I can't think of it. But um, I'll just go on. So here is the model. And you can very clearly see the one by three spine at the back. And of course, the engineers made, put a lot of uh, concrete and steel in there because they, they said in New York it was kind of a building that moves. So the, you know we thought that you know it was sort of nice to have steel that, that moves a bit, but they said you couldn't do that. And that's another issue that you're really uh, dealing with in your very thin, tall um, skyscra skyscrapers in your exhibition here. Uh, let's see. And so what, the, the, the plaza. Uh, was, uh, you know, has become kind of marvelous thing in the city, as you know. And I made, I asked Richard Pear, all the photographs I'm showing are from the time, except um, these, because uh, nobody's ever really studied the plaza or discussed it. It's just plaza, you know. But, you know, you have these wonderful, uh, you know, places here where, where you can go in here and, and there. And then, the you know the sense of me said something he said something wonderful about um, nature should also live its own life we should ex attempt to bring nature houses and human beings together in a higher in a higher unity and, um, and these are important things for cities and so I don't know what happens to all your skyscrapers at the ground floor. But that's a big, big, uh, really big issue. Uh, I see the fountains of our mast now. And here you see the mast. And here you see you know, that sort of great opening in the uh, city, but also <laughs> the people sitting all around here. And all those places that were uh, allowed to have a, you know, one square foot uh, for 10, 10 square feet of bulk, sort of th put concrete down. And Holly White, uh, W.H. White, really made a whole study. You know, all of this is in the book. I, I, I just don't want to show it here, of, of, of how people use the plaza. And this is just a tiny ledge here. Mies never thought anybody would go there. But people just sit all over the place and, uh, during the summer when it's or any weather. This is just, again, other kind of wonderful spaces to be in. And this is this very wide plaza. This was taken on the hottest day of the year a couple of years ago. And so you have this very deep plaza. And in the next image, I'm showing this is, yeah, okay. This shows the property line. You had to do that for legal reasons, to, so that you could claim that, so that this anything behind here belongs to Seagram. And then, and I saw this line is is is, is um, you know the property line goes to there. 
because of this Mies, he was a very generous man, he was a big man, and so he has these very generous spaces. And uh, uh, this, is, I, this is just one little story I'll tell about the quality of Mies. You, you know, on the, it, it goes down very sharply. And so the question was uh, what to do on the, um, you had to have a railing. And Mies said, yeah, why don't, you had to have a three foot six at that time. He said, yeah, why don't we lay down a big bench three foot six deep, and then uh, and the city accepted that. Ah. I think that's quite an extraordinary story. Yeah. And then, of course, there's seeing in. Oh, yes, that's the wonderful thing I wanted to say on that drawing. You know, most, as I said, you go up in the skyscraper, up in the elevators, and there's nothing else. But the fact that you have a low building on the plaza, you know, usually there's a, a separate building, but here, this is just a low back to the plaza. It's sort of like a four-story building or whatever. No, three-story, four-story deep and uh, nine bays wide. So you have these rooms, and these rooms are publicly, uh, people can, you see life in them. People are in there, they're not banks or things like that. I guess it could be a public room too, but how uh, dreary. So that this becomes so wonderful. And then, of course, you see inside and outside here, you see the fountains reflected, and that's the, uh, the, the bar and, um, uh, and grill room. And then on, I have a photograph of the inside, uh, where you, of course, again see the, you know, the green and the uh, plaza, the, uh, the, the, the fountain. And then I just want, this is, of course, this is great walk across, and then you see the reflection of the, you'll see in a second, the reflection of the uh, McKimmedian White Building, and the, at the same time, the uh, Picasso uh, painting. I'm just going to go very quickly by this, because I want to get to something else. This is the reflection of the McKimmedian White, of course. And I guess that's, oh no, public art. And then this is the Picasso curtain which is, um, it's wonderful stories about it, but I can't go into it. And it, what it was actually was cut down from this larger uh, piece of, uh, uh, of curtain, because as you know, uh, 20 feet is not high enough. I mean, that's 20 feet from the middle. And this is the uh, curtain, just so, so extraordinary that it fit there. We know, nothing was made for it, and, and it wasn't made for it that place either, but it just uh, worked so wonderfully. And of course, that's the uh, pool room on that side. And um, <laughs> this is, of course, the uh, work by, um, oh goodness, what's his name? That goes out of my head, Richard Lippold. Lippold. And that is an extraordinary, the reason that's there, it's a piece of art, but it was also worked out because the restaurateur said, the restaurateur said, you know, 20 feet is too high, we want, want something more intimate over the bar, and so this became the solution. Okay, this, the, from the beginning, this I never had anything to do with, but this was the Olmec head that was put on the plaza. And uh, so the, the plaza has become a place for exhibiting uh, works, and unfortunately that doesn't happen now. Seagram doesn't own it anymore, it's owned by, uh, what's his R.B.? A.B. Uh, Rose. Hmm? Yeah, A.B. Rose. And uh, so this was the... Um, I always forget everybody's name, so I have to look at my, my, my cheek slips. I'm sure somebody knows who it is. But anyway. Barton Newman Opolis. Hmm? Barton Newman's Opolis. The, the sculpture is Barton Newman. It's yes, Barton Newman. Yes, that's right. The Museum of Modern Art. Yes, it was in the Museum. Not necessarily this one. But um, is it this one? I'm not sure. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. And I love that photograph, I think it's great. You see the church down there. And this, uh, this you see, it became an event too. This was light up by um, uh, Tony Smith. And this was on the plaza in well, 71, I guess. And uh, so it, uh, these are just a few of the images of it going up. And here you find um, Richard Long doing his brownstone circle. And I can give you the exact date because it was taken the day he was installing it on a in April in, 19, in 2000, I guess. 
and here it is installed. And so you have, you know, it was just a kind of a place where all sorts of things were possible. And we'll talk about that in a minute when I talk about Joel, Joel Shapiro that was there in 70, fall of 86. And my lord, uh, by, by uh, my lord, mm, um, well, somewhere. Uh, yeah, my lord uh, La Chamar by Jean de Buffet was there in 74, 75. Okay, now I get to the real point of my talk, and this thing isn't, doesn't want to move anymore. No, I don't want to be there. Okay. Sustaining architectural culture, you know, this uh, question is stewardship. And there are three aspects I want to talk about. One, I, I just had all that stuff to go to build up to this. One is taxation, one is landmarking, and one is air rights. Taxation. No, this is landmark. Okay. Taxation. I'm going to read a bit here because it's such an extraordinary situation. Seagram found out uh, by 1961, I don't know, 61 seems to be my day today, uh, the year today, but in 61 they re realized that they were being uh, actually taxed much, much at a much higher rate than all of the other uh, new buildings that had been built relatively to the skies and square feet and things like that. And so there were a number of issues that the city, it was the city who first taxed it, and then the, then the, the Seagram took it to the lower court, which was called the higher court, and they had, took it all the way up to no, the Supreme Court, and then the higher court was one, the last one. Supreme Court is not the higher court, it's the lower court, but very silly naming. But anyway, the concept of the Seagram building, it contains only half the amount of the floor space which a normal office building would contain. It cannot be valued, therefore, as an ordinary commercial structure on the basis of capitalization of income, but must be treated something in the nature of a specialty, a limited specialty that might be more appropriate terms uh, and valued on the basis of depreciated replacement costs. This is the uh, city. Um, uh, then Seagram uh, was a petitioner, and they, they, they thought that the city is entitled to tax the petitioner uh, not merely on, the, you know, they sort of said, they're not taxing us not merely on the building uh, that we built, but also on the building we didn't build. And in other words, a building of such great expense must bring to its owners value above and beyond rental income. So they're saying, you know, that there's something else to this, but uh, just, you know, if you build a building that uh, you value, Seagram did a crazy, they didn't do a very good job in uh, arguing this. They sort of said the value was uh, um, 17 million and the building cost 35, so you see there's a little problem there. And uh, a building of such great expense must bring to its owners value above and beyond uh, rental income. This extra value was uh, prestige, they said. Uh, Stoyer, this is the Judge Stoyer, wrote that the prestige building has a rental value not based alone on, on commercially rented space, but on the building's value in promoting the economic, economic interest of the owner. So they're going all over the place on this. Right. Then, uh, Sto for Stoyer, it was a matter of ideological principles. Such buildings contribute to the owner's prestige and exemplify the economic theory, doctrine of conspicuous waste. Of course, he got that wrong. It was conspicuous consumption. Uh, uh, waste, described by Thor Thor Thorsten Bevan, of course, as designed to impress the observer with the owner's pecuniary strengths. Um, the higher court, uh, okay, so it goes up to the highest court. The higher court did not uh, include prestige, that uh, the prestige should be included in the valuation, or that the unbuilt airspace of the plaza should be valued. Nor did it adopt the concept of a specialty building. So all of these things were turned down, but still, Seagram still lost. 
the court ruled seven to one with a majority of four and a minority of three to uphold the, 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 the city of New York's uh, basic, so that they're half and half about it. The unifying thread between the majority and minority, oh, I don't think I want to read that. I'll read the next little piece. Um, <coughs> Ultimately, it is not only, this is my writing, ultimately it's not only a matter of considerable irony, but also deeply disturbing that the courts could not agree on the terms and approaches to be applied. Real estate lawyer Timothy Moore commented that the unusual facts often result in muddled court decisions, and the Seagram case is proof in point. However, one must also assume a certain uh, discriminating, a discrimination against Seagram. At least the two notable uh, pre-war structures, the Crystal Building and the Rockefeller Center, exhibited extravagant use of materials and decoration, and Rockefeller Center had de uh, dedicated uh, a considerable open space to public, to public use. The pre proceedings show that evidence of a puritanical uh, posture in the court's deliberation that could not have been allied to uh, opportunism, uh, uh, could be applied to the opprobrium held against a whiskey company, and they were very concerned about this at the same time as Egan was, going back to prohibition and rekindled in 1950 and 51 by the uh, Kefauver Commission on hearings on, on organized crime. The Court of Appeals uh, departed from the concept of prestige that the appellate division had put forward, as well as the motion of conspicuous waste, and the presiding judge, Charles, De uh, Charles De Desmond, described the excess tax as a realty tax directly attributable to the space you can use. So they, they, they dropped all that and said, okay, you have 2,000 square feet, that we'll, 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 we'll tax that in a way. And Seagram lost because they didn't have good arguments. They, they undervalued the uh, rents they were getting. I don't know how they messed that up, but it was a, a, a problem for them, but you know, they got a lot in rent that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, because of the quality of the building, and uh, actually the people who own it now are trying to sort of price gouge, I'm afraid. Uh, Your machine doesn't like me anymore. Like the <laughs> Could you push this forward? Oh, I have to do that? No, it just doesn't work. Okay. Now we're talking about landmarking. Oh, no, 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 go back to where you were. Okay, we're talking about landmarking. Well, of course, at the time that Seagram tax, that taxation was a cause celebre, because it got in the papers and, and it was uh, argued in the courts that, to, uh, con that, the, that the courts were really condemning, the city was condemming good construction, that this, would, that this kind of taxation would, uh, would um, uh, discourage people from doing uh, good, good buildings. And, uh, and th at the same time, the, uh, the um, station, the uh, McKinney and White's great uh, Pennsylvania station was going to come down and Ada Louise Huxtable said very correctly, there's no way you can stop it, we had no tools. And so at that time, that was when by 65, landmarking came into New York. And of course, Seagram was uh, sold once and uh, at that time it was written into the um, uh, bill of uh, the sale uh, that they had, uh, they had to apply for landmarking when it was going to occur. And during that time, we protected it with we, the Seagram Company, working with me and the lawyers. Uh, I, well, I, I actually brought in our architects, uh, Giovanna Passanella and Klein, to, to really s to base everything on documents. This is hugely important, to be able to uh, you know, say what you protect and why and what the maintenance of is all these uh, parts. And so when it came up for, when, when Seacom came up for uh, landmarking, 
everything was fine outside was fine although I think that you, they should have they really should have I, I asked but they never never did it to take the a glass building you can't just do the surface because you see into a glass building so they should have taken it back 16 feet at least you know the, the, the office the, the luminous ceiling and so that's a problem now too but uh, but they did uh, 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 landmark the outside they landmarked the lobby they landmarked the plaza and they landmarked they wanted to landmark the restaurant but the owner who, who was at that point teachers uh, insurance and annuity association said no this is a restraint in trade what happens if the restaurant rest, restaurant people it doesn't work out or blah 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 anyway there was a, it was brought up in front of again the courts huge court case and so <laughs> what the teachers people did was that they took pho they took photographs of the oops well that's all right and they took photographs of the existing and then ripped everything out and sort of removed everybody else and said, but this is nothing space. Could you do the next one? Okay. Whoops. And, and so, and for some reason they left the pool in this one. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but of course I didn't fly and everybody said, of course, it's magnificent space and this, this was going to fly. But anyway, it, it was, uh, it went to a higher, or to, to a city court that doesn't exist anymore. And, but the same pr principle holds. And so they said, no, 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 this had to be, there were other examples of restaurants that had been landmarked, etc., etc. So, but it was a tight and tense fight because of that. Then the next thing was the question of, can we go back to the last slide? There. The next question was the question of air rights. Well, I've mentioned a number of times that secret building could have been twice as big as it was. Well, this is a risk. Somebody's going to buy it and say, ha ha, we'll put, actually at one point, there was a question of putting banks on the corner. I think it was just because they were a little bit nervous about, uh, at least my father was, about the building not renting fast enough. Of course, that was never a problem, really. And uh, well, that's another interesting story, but I can't tell it right now because I have to get onto this. And so, um, I, I was always very conscious of the fact that you had to do something about the land uh, the air rights, and I had hoped that we could either get property on the site that site behind site two. There, site site two, which is on Lexington Avenue. And or site one, and the uh, the um, uh, Citibank owned that building there, which they didn't build. It was built by somebody else, and they took it over. It's not a very distinguished job. They did a better job there, but at that point they hadn't built that building. And I guess I wasn't good enough at arguing, or it took me too long to convince Seagram that they might be able to discuss that with uh, the, the bank. And so it really never happened. But uh, I looked at. Uh, you know what would happen if we transferred from uh, oops there <laughs> this thing is a little sick you need a new one anyway this is as of right okay this is a model I made in my office and then this is if you transferred the uh, to directly behind the Seagram building what would happen if you transferred that 50,000 500,000 square feet that you could transfer and then the one on the left of course is a better solution where it isn't directly behind it but of course the inevitable happens and uh, and um, uh, <coughs> RB developments what is that man's name? It's A.B. Rosen. A.B. Rosen, yeah. It's RFR. Yeah, RFR, thank you. And so they were very smart. When they, bought, they bought the Lever House, and then sometime later they bought Seagram. And that's, that's a whole other huge thing about values of buildings and at the time you build them and when you uh, give long leases and what happens so that eventually in New York what happened that the proudest names 
like uh, Rockefeller Center bought, bought the Japanese, the uh, um, Lincoln Center, uh, AT&T uh, was bought 10 years after it was built and turned into Sony, etc., etc., etc. So there's always this uh, shifting and going on. And so A.B. Rosen realized that um, he could buy uh, the property, I don't know if he bought it before or not, behind. Well, there are two properties. It's a 90 foot deep and 200 feet wide, of course, area. And there's some really awful black building there, but it's not so awful because you never see it. I mean, I don't think anybody here could even say what the building looks like. It's just a nothing, and it's wonderful because you don't see it. But they uh, taking the 500 uh, um, X, uh, square foot, uh, oh, 500,000, what's that, yeah, half a million square feet. Uh, I guess it was maybe the first pencil uh, building, a, t a very tall building that they were going to do, so it's 90 by 90, and Foster did this scheme for them. Well, that was just before 208, and so the economics didn't turn out, but I think they'll do it, they'll do it. I'm sure they'll do it, especially now, when it's becoming a la mode. And then, Finally, of course, this is the building that um, Citibank built, which is uh, by Hugh Stebbins. And uh, all of these buildings, this was, the, the, again, the area. First of all, it was the area where they built those, those setback uh, ziggurats, okay? And now it became the only area in New York where people started to build some ambitious architecture. Of course, downtown, uh, the Rockefellers did. But here, this was, uh, you know, uh, this is quite an interesting building in very many ways. And uh, again, using, the, because of Seagram having changed the regulations, they again uh, b b b used extra bulk to the building. And then, of course, you have the IBM building, which is now called simply 590 Madison, okay? And there again, the, uh, you know, and what happened was that they got the, they were allowed to build the extra bulk. And then what did they do? They, they, they changed afterwards. They're not, they're not penalized for having then gone back. For example, uh, Sony filled in all that space that Philip had made underneath. It wasn't very good space, I must admit. But, you know, you'd think that you get some sort of f penalty for that. But no, nobody, nobody ever talked about that. And um, uh, certainly uh, 590 people diminished the quality of the space that had been built by um, IBM. And there's Phil, oh, there's Phil's building. And then across, as you see, you see the, um, here, it's a little hard to read this. This is the uh, McKimmead and White building, and this is Seagram on the side. And that's a building which is called something or other place, Park Place or something like that. It was built, built by SOM behind the, um, uh, the um, McKimmead and White Racket and tennis, ten, tennis Club. And there was a lot of discussion about that. Uh, we discussed that with the, um, the community uh, council number five and things like that. And finally, you know, there was nothing that could be done about it. And so Seagram is now sort of in a, I, um, in a, has all these huge buildings around it. No, 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 there. So this is, when we finished building the building, I guess it's finished, yep. And you see, there was nothing around. Well, the only site that was being, that started to be built was to the north, and that was the, um, uh, the city bank, well, which be became the city bank. But you know, all the buildings I've just shown you were, were, were just not built. It was an entirely different place. And, I didn't mean to lose that. And so now you have, you see the, the uh, Citibank building behind there, and the rather lousy one here. But, you know, just the same, there's a kind of, <coughs> you don't see buildings from the air, air, or if you do, it's in passing, uh, you walk on the street, and so there is this still wonderful place that sits there, no matter how much it sort of gets closed in by all these very high. Uh, so this is the kind of the perils perils of, of buildings. I wonder when they'll build, build buildings that are higher than the pencil buildings they're building now. I don't know. But this is what I really wanted to talk about, and I did, and thank you. <laughs> Do 
you want to answer questions or do you want to have um, questions? Maybe we could ask the audience uh, if they have a few questions and um, take a few minutes to do that. We also have some time for a reception <laughs> afterwards. Okay. So maybe a few questions right now. Mm -hmm. Of course, the first question never comes. <laughs> Oh, good. Did you know that the Picasso curtain is threatened yet again? Pardon? The Picasso curtain. Yes. They're threatening to remove it again. You know that? Yes. How do you know that? That's, I, I, you are right. Hey, hey, Green is trying to rally the troops. Pardon? Hey, Green? Yes, indeed. Indeed. And the, uh, the Conservancy. He, he was uh, A.B. Rosen told the restaurant, okay, the restaurant belongs to the, uh, the, the two people who run the restaurant, and also to my brother, my nephew, my nephew Edgar Jr., because, and this is kind of important, because when they wanted to buy the lease, they couldn't quite finance it, and they spoke to Edgar about it, he said, okay, I'll join you on it, okay? So they control everything, but the, that, that Castle Alley is uh, uh, actually the responsibility for it lies in the uh, Seagram building itself because the restaurant people didn't want to be bothered with it. Well, now, now they have their comeuppance because he said there is a problem with water behind the, you know, it's just a kitchen behind there. The problem with water behind that, so everybody looks at water, and of course there is no water there. He wants to put his own junk there, okay? He wants to be able to take that space and put up some, you know, he thinks of himself as a, a great um, uh, uh, patron of the arts. And you see the work that he puts up in Lever House. And um, so he wanted to, he really wants to remove that Picasso curtain so they can do it. So the problem is, uh, I don't know what's going to happen because he, the lease comes up in two years. And if, uh, if um, I mean, this is something we're all working on right now, because if when the list comes up, and let, let's say um, the people, person owners can't buy the lease or extend the lease or whatever they have to do, which is at this point threatened absolutely, then um, the next uh, probably the the, the next um, uh, owner will there'll be a condition that was put in them. However, that curtain was given to the conservancies to, for it to be in perpetuity in that place. So I don't know what the legal issues are, but it's a whole big deal, and I wish people would talk about it. Just you never heard it from me. <laughs> Yes? Did you have a mentor that got you into architecture, or how did you get a class? As a kid, I used to walk down the streets of uh, Montreal and saw these wonderful gray stone buildings. And uh, when I went to college, I, I was a sculptor as a child. I was a sculptor. I used to exhibit my work at jury shows when I was a child. And then I, when I went to college, I minored in art history. And uh, at the Last year, I, there was a kind of an arts conference between Yale and Vassar, where I was at. I was at Vassar. And um, a friend of mine said, why don't we do an exhibition, you know, sort of like this, because we did it on brown paper, with cut out from magazines, on, on art and architecture. And this was in 1948? Well, that's not so far from 1920s, you know? So we were looking at the work of, and there's, there's no better way to learn than when you do it yourself. You're not asked by a professor to, th to work out a theory. You're working it out yourself and you're searching for it, you know? And so we uh, cut up these magazines. We made this wonderful show, obviously showing Breuer and Mies and, uh, you know, everyone of that period. So I'd learned a lot then. And then um, when uh, I just was passionate about architecture. That's all. Well, I, and I, you know, because I think that cities are hugely important. And, you know, you walk down the streets. I don't know if you're like that, but when I walk down the street, that's depressing. I get very depressed. And c cities are places where the, 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 we're, we're sort of bred in cities, and we grow up to have a quality of life and a quality of mind. And, uh, you know, I think that's, I, I just think that's so important. question that I, I don't think I remember reading the answer to in the book, and that is, had you spent much time in New York before working on the project? 
Well, as a child, well, my father had his offices here. Uh, I asked when they took them in the secret which is, well, I was just very small, 32 or something like that, 33. And uh, we used to come down in the summers and have, um, we'd, we'd have a house in Long Island or you know, somewhere like that. And um, then we, my parents bought a house in Tarrytown and I went to college near New York, and I was, we, uh, the, he had an apartment at the St. Regis Hotel, you know, company apartment. So I was back and forth all the time in New York. New York was sort of my second home. It was just a natural place for me, but... Um, so did you feel like a New Yorker when you started this project? I've never not felt like a New Yorker. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, it's, it's a small child. You go from one place to the other, you constantly do that. And, I mean, Montreal seemed to me a sophisticated town. I didn't realize the rest of America was not like that, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, remember st I remember being in the 16th floor of the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the hotel and looking down and seeing these little tiny co machines down there, little cars. I, it was fascinating, you know. I, 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 I guess that's what I was always drawn to, uh, architecture in one way or the other. Those, some of those pictures showed you in the room with, filled with men. Yeah, yeah. And it reminded me of pictures of Florence Knoll in the same situation. Yeah, sure. And we were both contemporary, of course. So the, were the, the two of you and uh, did you develop a friendship? No, so but we knew. It, no, we didn't. But we knew each other. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You said you uh, obviously eventually settled on me, but. Who was probably the closest second? Uh, there was only, there, you know, those who could and should, okay? Right. Well, there was Mies, and there was Le Corbusier, and of course you had to think about Frank Lloyd Wright, but he was not really considered because, you know, he was, he sort of expressed the time when America was, uh, uh, you know, um, Go West, young man. They kind of, what was it called, the Westward? Uh, yes, right. And, and and so he was a whole other period. And um, so I guess the only uh, certainly Walter Gropius, not at all. And uh, although he he made a big pitch for it, which I found rather sad. But um, <laughs> but uh, certainly. You know, Saarinen did, but late in a way he he he, he came back and. He, he actually described the building that he actually built for the Black Rock for uh, CBS. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, you go down. I don't know why you want to go down to a new building, but I mean, I remember his saying that. And then he'd make, he would make, everybody was always, all these people were always talking in terms of Mies, you know. He would make uh, the outside more sculptural than Mies, uh, you know, so sort of all the things he did at the Black Rock. But those were the only two that, that really did. But what was the question again? Yeah. Who was basically? Yeah, yeah. So, but Le Corbusier. I didn't go to see Le Corbusier, but I knew his work pretty well. I, first of all, concrete. Well, of course, he had done the. He hadn't done, but he had done the uh, UN building, and that was. I mean, you know, it was taken over by Wally Harrison. So all the slick things are his. But Corbusier really was somebody who built in concrete and so beautifully and so wonderfully. But. Um, you know, New York is not a concrete city, and and, uh, and I didn't think it would be, I thought his very sculptural kind of uh, buildings, uh, in and out and all that sort of stuff, would not be a very good influence in New York. I guess I have a much more of a sense of classicism in my bones than I do, uh, you know, that kind of romanticism. And, yes? Do you have a favorite new building in New York, or one that you particularly hate? <laughs> what I particularly hate? Oh, there are too many to hate. Uh, um, I don't know, I haven't been looking around. You know, I've been so busy giving talks on my book <laughs> that, I, that I haven't uh, really gone around New York, but I'm going to do that sometime early in the year. And um, I mean, I think there's some, I think what you know, Carol is showing here is very interesting. You know, I think that the pe what I think that what's interesting in New York is, are, are sort of what L Diller and Scafidio are doing. I'm not sure about their tall building there. I haven't look, really looked at that. But um, I think there are other concerns about those. But, you know, what they did at Lincoln Center is just brilliant. And what they did, the, the, um, 
the what's it called the high line. That's how we can start to make cities decent, you know. And all of that is people walking on the ground. It's not the girth of the building, you know. And so I think that, that what happens to the ground. Yeah, you're going to have to address that one of these days, uh, Carol, I think, with skyscrapers, because that's really hugely important. And, um, and you know, they've been so successful. And I think that's, uh, I th think, you know, that's a, that one worries about how streets, that, that people are using bicycles now. You know, I think I would hate to do that in New York. It's sort of scary. But still, I think that there's a very big difference. And, and, and looking at the ground, looking where you walk, looking at the uh, receptivity of a, of a city, uh, of its um, sense of magic, imaginative, uh, making the imagination work and think. I think those, those are the things that must be looked at. Architects are considered um, often sort of hard to work with, and then when architects have to work with each other, it gets uh, difficult. And you had not one, not two, but I understand three architects, three firms working on this project. How did they sort it out? Well, let me first of all say something interesting. In Chicago, Mies was given the federal building with uh, uh, with um, what was it, Murphy and some other great firm. And so the senator who was responsible for that, somebody asked him uh, who, wh what he thought Mies was going to be doing. He said, well, we didn't think he was going to be doing the plumbing, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, it was Mises' building. Philip knew that, and Philip Philip did the. Uh, you know, he, he Philip had come from the Museum of Art just recently. He just left it, and you know, good design, and so he wanted to have all the appurtenances, all of the, uh, the, the the graphics, the uh, door handles, the sinks and bathrooms, and all the, those things. And the best design, the elevator shafts, the elevators, the best you could do, and he did that. But uh, you know, and that's nice and good. But uh, he, and then he did the. Um, but he was very interested in lighting, and lighting was the thing that brought him away from the international style and gave him, you know, another direction. And that brought him into historical, um, being interested in bringing back historicism into into architecture. And um, so that he did the lighting on the building and the, and the Four Seasons, you know, was one for it. I think he did uh, br brilliantly there. But, um, you know, there was a certain amount of tension between Mies and Philip in a way at the beginning because, you know, the first great glass house was Mises, and, but it hadn't been built. But Philip built his beforehand. Mises had designed it in 45, and, uh, but uh, not built till later, and Philip had built his in... Uh, th 49, yeah. But, um, so, so, and then as far as uh, um, Colin James, we had one office. The, 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 the design office was downstairs and then took more space and another floor. I, mean, I had my office with the architects. And so that's where the people who are, you know, all, all the, because you needed quite a team to do, prepare the working drawings and the drawings at the same time. So, um, but Mies is certainly not hard to work with. Uh, uh, Philip might be, I don't know. Uh, I, I think, I don't know why architects are supposedly hard to work with. Maybe it's the client that they're hard to work with. Did the, did the support firm hmm? respect Mies and Philip? Well, you, well, you could see when they said that they wanted to change the building to a four by five, baby. I don't consider that respect. But uh, they did, I mean, they got into line. <laughs> they, 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 they understand where their bread is buttered, you know. And when 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 the, when the BMO, his, his, you know, these great building managers, said, "I know this is a wonderful building, and this is absolutely right." Uh, from there on, that they were okay. I, I considered my job to be to make sure that he's got the building done he wanted to. Do. So, so uh, like the, the head of the building committee, <laughs> you know, but uh, I guess I was lucky because my father never gave me the job. I just took it, but he never said no. <laughs> but, but I guess that, um, you know, corporations are very, very hierarchical. So if I would say that 
I don't know that wall is black. They'd say, yes, Mrs. Lambert, it's black, you know. And so uh, people would, and so, you know, once I was there, well, Philip said, I was in all, all the, the meetings, and he said, though she didn't know anything about architecture, really, she wasn't an architect, but there was no hanky-panky. <laughs> so people, you know, he said, it was sort of, but um, I, I was just determined, you know, and, um, uh, to 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 see see this through, and so I, I pushed everything the, out of the way that that, that would disrupt that, that possibility. I, I think that's a, a good place to okay, great. end by by saying, from 27 years old to when you know it's been much published now that you're 86 years old. Yes, 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 that's true. Uh, that <laughs> The, the the mark of the woman was absolutely there in, at, at age 27, and everything that she's been talking about in terms of this commitment was has been carried through every year of her life until now. So, I you know thank you, Phyllis, for it's not going to stop. <laughs> <laughs>